Today's interview is with Ryan Nunes. Um, Ryan Nunes used to work in the oil and gas industry. He talks a little bit about that and what he sees in that industry these days. So that's a great insight for all of us. Um, but also now he invests in multifamily apartment syndication. So if that's something you're interested, he talks about how he's done it, how he's been successful, some tips, tips and tricks along the way. So if that's something you're interested, stick around for today's interview. As always, like and subscribe on the YouTube channel, Wrestling With Real Estate. Go to the WWRE podcast and give me a five-star rating and write me a review if you think it's worthy. And, and I'm looking to talk to as many of you as I can about real estate. I love talking about real estate. It's my favorite thing. Um, so there's going to be a link in the description down below or you can go to the website wrestlingwithrealestate.com and sign up there. I would love to get to know more about what your goals are, what you're trying to achieve and see if there's any way whatsoever I can help you. So enjoy today's interview with Ryan Nunes. Hello and welcome to Wrestling With Real Estate, where we look to choke slam all your real estate problems. I'm your host, former WWE wrestler and now Cirque du Soleil performer, and of course, multifamily real estate investor, Barry Griffiths. Now today we're joined by Ryan Nunes. Hey, Ryan. Hello. Hey, Barry. Thanks for having me on. I'm, I'm, you're welcome. I'm, I'm very excited and happy that you were able to make the time and come talk to us today. I'm really excited about today's t uh, talk. We've got a lot of cool stuff to talk to, but before we kind of get into it, you, you want to tell us a little bit more about yourself and kind of what you're focused on now? Sure. So we'll, we'll do a little real estate and then we'll do a little wrestling too. So, <laughs> so uh, I grew up in New Jersey, went to Georgetown, did my undergrad, or my undergrad at Georgetown, my MBA at NYU, and then uh, joined a, a company where I was doing different rotations throughout, uh, you know, different managerial type positions and uh, had an opportunity to do my MBA part-time on nights and weekends and was rubbing shoulders with a lot of people that were working on Wall Street and uh, realized quickly that I was I did my undergrad in finance, was majoring in, in finance for my MBA and just decided this is what I want to do. I want to go work on Wall Street and kind of my skill set is best suited towards sales. So I had an opportunity to join a bank on Wall Street in commodity derivatives. And this was kind of when oil and gas was going through kind of the revolution, the shell revolution was similar to you know internet shopping and the internet revolution it was just a massive step change in the oil and gas space and so it was it was in the right place at the right time just great market uh, extremely volatile but uh, just did did really well was there for 13 years got promoted early and to managing director before i was i guess i was 30 or so and um you know it's had a really good run and then for many years as there was disruption in the oil and gas space and now we're talking about you know the end of oil and so forth um you know i had, had kind of seen some of this coming and said what what else could i do you know and for for about the past four years i'd made it my new year's resolution to say what what could I do that is um, a good fit for my transferable skills, something I could be passionate about and, um, you know, would have an impact on people was kind of the criteria I was looking for. And, and, and then lastly, to apprentice my kids, I have two small kids or eight and 10. And so to just get them involved and had looked at a lot of different things, had looked at, you know, starting a franchise, had looked at, you know, starting my own school, a music school and doing a lot of different restaurant and then when I came across multifamily, I was like, this is what I've been looking for for four years. And so jumped right in and had a fair amount of taxable income I needed to tax shelter and um, needed to get into some co-sponsoring roles. So um, I came across a gentleman that had some live deals and we got to know each other and just, you know, developed a good like in trusting with him. And, uh, you know, he said, you can get your hands as dirty as you want. So I jumped in on two opportunities and, you know, quickly a month or two into those, and um, they were about 394 units. Uh, I guess it was around 35 or so million dollars of assets. And uh, just getting my hands dirty with the asset management, I, I said, you know, this is very similar to the businesses that I've run on Wall Street. And, uh, you know, just applying how I've been successful and then applying it to this and just gave me a lot of confidence and comfort that, uh, you know, I've typically been a very process heavy person. If I, you know, you know, this, this and outcome success and, um, and so have been applying that over the past year and a half and have seen, you know, the fruits of the labor, uh, 
you know, partway into that, I said, you know, I also want someone that uh, has worked on Wall Street and has been through that experience. And so I uh, partnered with another gentleman that's uh, an ex Wall Street private equity guy. And so we've been tag teaming for for over the past year and have, have really built, you know, rebuilt our models, just done everything from scratch with a new lens. And, you know, just taking a very institutional professional approach to the asset class. Uh, so that's on the real estate side. On the wrestling side, I hit my peak uh, when I was eight years old. I went to SummerSlam 88 with the Hulk Hogan t-shirt. I still remember it was at the Meadowlands in New Jersey. And uh, my dad is uh, is a wrestling fanatic. He still watches it to this day. So I peaked in SummerSlam 88, Hulk <laughs> rules, saw um, the Ultimate Warrior uh, and so forth. And my dad, though, still keeps watching it. And, um, you know, for me... You know, it was hard to tell. Like he just kept saying it was real. And I don't know. I mean, you tell me if it's, you know, what it is. But he still watches it on replay. Doesn't miss it. And, uh, you know, so so look forward to You got to send an autograph or something. Or we yeah, do some type of, you know, screenshot of, of uh, us being on the same podcast. So appreciate so did the invite. That, and, did your dad still think he's it's real? Yeah, he he loves it. <laughs> I mean, he's he's like, ooh, ow, oh, ooh. <laughs> That's he feels every like. blow like it's you know 3d virtual <laughs> reality that's amazing that's amazing i love that i was always great to, to see you know it's great to have the kids and stuff like that and you know of course it, i enjoyed performing from the kids but it was also cool to always see the adults you know because watching you could always get the kids involved right you could always see when you were when you were wrestling and you could see the crowd you could always kind of easy to get the kids they'll kind of buy into a lot of stuff but once you got the adults going ooh, oh you're like okay this is a good match or this is you know this yes. is, things are going well because you the adults are harder to fool so that's cool that your dad that your dad was in there so uh, that's a really cool story i you know that was such an interesting story you said, said a lot of things one thing i, I think is not wrestling re related but uh, you might be a good person to answer and might be interested is how do you see the you know energy going do you, do you see an end to, to oil and you know tesla's exploding and electric cars and you know how do you how do you feel about the, that kind of thing that might be an interesting quick topic yeah. yeah for sure so you know my my thoughts are that it's it's uh you know there's some headwinds for it but you know there's a lot of people i mean uh, until electric cars become you know so affordable particularly in you know countries overseas china india and so forth um you know, to buy, you know, they have a car in India that's 2000 or so dollars. And so, you know, when electric cars can start breaking into that space, I think that's when, you know, you're already nibbling away at the, the oil demand, but, you know, to really do away with oil, I think you need quite a bit. And so that's, you know, we think of oil for transportation, but, you know, just as I'm looking at, you know, my what's around me, anything plastic that you're touching um, is made from petrochemicals. So, you know, that you're still going to need oil and gas demand for those things. Uh, so, you know, actually, uh, yeah, I mean, I, I've actually thought there's been a quite a bit of value in some of these these companies, particularly on the midstream side, that, uh, you know, are 10% dividend yields, which, you know, in, in some in most cases are, are more attractive than than multifamily right now, frankly. So uh, just they've gotten so depressed, but they they do have the liquidity that, you know, you can get in and out of them. So um, I think that there's some bargains there. It seems like a lot of the stock market has appreciated, but a number of these oil and gas companies have been left behind. Interesting, very interesting. That's a, it, you know, it's it's good to kind of hear that other side because we, we we're very real estate dependent on yes, this show. Yes. I, foc I focus a lot on real estate on this show, but it's also interesting to hear that. Kind of point of view. Something else interesting you said. We'll, we'll dive into the other real estate in a second, but as you talked about that, you wanted to kind of influence your kids into sort of and steer them into so it was, was that because you wanted them to be open to the entrepreneurial mindset and to kind of realize that because um, it's something i have an interest with my, and my son's only one but how to steer them because you know entrepreneurial um the entrepreneurial world is a great world to be in right especially investing and you don't need to go to college necessarily right if they might want to but that, that whole aspect of how, how do you steer them and i think that's really interesting so so that what that played a heavy part in why you chose um real estate and multifamily yeah, absolutely I, I think for a few reasons is one you know just as a, a professional on wall street is it's kind of liking it to whether you know professional wrestling 
professional football as is probably a good example where you know you're always kind of one blow away from you know being very highly compensated to 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 not and you know just that that dependency when everything is going great um you know it's awesome but when things change you know you just want to have that plan b or something else where you feel like hey i can put food on the table or hey you know, I am learning something and feel engaged and feel like my skills are being applied. And so, you know, for me, that was just a personal goal that, um, you know, I think any multifamily opportunity put in front of me, at least I'll just say in the U.S. because, you know, overseas, I haven't haven't looked at those markets, but, you know, I could put a number on it in, in you know, whether that's, you know, a 10 unit property, whether it's a thousand unit property or so forth, you know, we want to be able to price anything and everything and that's multifamily. So, so that was kind of one, you know, just really having that hunger to say, I want to be really good at at this. And then two, you know, I think we we hope and pray that our kids, um, you know, go to the right schools and meet the right friends and 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 all that. And and one thing that I'll just say is that, um, you know, what if we had the opportunity to try and influence that somehow instead of instead of being you know bystanders i hope they get into this school which you know i, I remember that i i got into georgetown i got waitlisted at Rutgers, you know which is a state school in new jersey which is you know night and day difference in terms of in terms of education but um you know to me that just said it was a fluky process so do i want to you know put my kids in this fluky process and not have you know some other hedge that we could build for their academic career and so that was just something i've been thinking about for many years and something that i could be able to train them and pass on to them and you know recently i took my daughter for some property tours She's 10 and we've driven by a lot of properties, but, uh, you know, she had uh, a little break during the summer. So we went toward two deals here in Houston and, you know, it's just a good opportunity for her to ask questions and she's, she, you know, she's, she's understanding it. And I think real estate, it's a nice thing to the, one of the big things about it, it that's uh, attractive is that it is easy to understand. You know, it's, it's basically, you need tenants and you need to treat them well and you need them to pay their rent and, and uh, you need them to stay in their property. So it's, it's uh, and buy low, sell high is, 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 a, is a very much a commodity thing. So um, as it is any market. So uh, those, those things are, are easy to understand. And, and, you know, there's a lot of nuances in multifamily, but um, at a high level, I think it's, it's a, uh, gives me an opportunity to also, you know, make sure I'm understanding my craft, if I can explain it to them in a, in a way that's palatable and easy to digest. Yeah. How, how did she like it? She, is she taking stuff on board or is she fights it back against it? Yeah, no, she asks a lot of questions. Uh, you know, I think she's, she's got a strong aptitude for business, which is awesome. And, you know, she negotiates with me and I think a <laughs> funny story on that. We, you know, one of the first deals that I co-sponsored, I was putting a fair amount of my capital in a deal. And she had just gotten five hundred dollars from her grandmother um, from overseas and was visiting with us. And I said, "Hey, well, why don't we invest this in this deal?" And she goes, "No, no, no way! I don't want to lose five hundred dollars." She goes, "I'll invest a <laughs> hundred." So I thought that was pretty funny. Uh, but that deal's doing well; it's doing really well. So um, you know, so you still working on that investor relations with her? I'm still working. She's a tough customer, so uh, that's, keeps so me on my toes. Great. Yeah, that's great though, because that. Even though my son is one, I'm already thinking about that, you know, because I know from a personal standpoint that if something is pushed down your throat too much, you're going to rebel against it, right? Whatever your parents say, for the most part, you're going to want to do the opposite. So I, I think that's a great approach and just taking around it, not forcing, just having a be around it. That's kind of what I see for in the future for my kid and any other kids that we have uh, is that, you know, just bring them around this, see the success that I have, see hopefully the life that you create for yourself and kind of want them to want the same rather than be like, Hey, you need to be a real estate investor. You're going to be a real estate investor, you know, and real estate is great, but just by seeing it and osmosis, I think, I think that's sure. a great, yeah. And have them, have them reach that decision by themselves, right. Rather than you trying to tell them that's cool. So cool. So let's, well, let's dive into the real estate a little bit more. Sure. You decided that real estate multifamily, you know, you were looking at all these other um, possibilities, right? You know, to start your own company, to run your own business, restaurants, right? That was, how long did that last? The, the idea of a restaurant, was that, was that scary? You know, these, these are things that I didn't, I didn't, I didn't pull the trigger on any of these. These were just thoughts and, you know, preliminary, just, you know, a couple days, a couple 
you know, yeah. very preliminary cursory looks at them and, you know, to really understand, is this something I'm passionate about, but I didn't commit any capital or anything like that to those ventures. And it was more just, you know, this exploring stage, which, you know, for me and my life is, is kind of, you know, let's try a lot of things and then, you know, let's figure out what, what, what really resonates and, and then, and then just full steam ahead, you know, with blinders on. So that's, that's been a little bit of the process. Yeah. Yeah. So you, you, um, and what, why multifamily was something that you, why was it you chose multifamily? You know, because in real estate, you have like all kinds of options. Right? Yes. You're, yes. You're millionaires in all, yes. all kinds. Sure. Of sure. Why you, you know, no, that's a great question. So for me, it was about, it was about, you know, what am I passionate about? And I thought about, okay, like, let's think about storage and let's think about multifamily, you know, it's, it's just an example. So storage is all about things, right? You're, you care about, things that people are putting in there and you're, and then multifamily is all about the tenants and the people and, and, and so forth. And for me, I'm just more gravitating towards the people aspect and how do we, from a customer service perspective, how do we make that, you know, a great customer experience. And so that's, what's been important for me on the multifamily side and why it resonates. And so that's kind of one of the big differences, but um, as well as just the thesis that I overlay on top of my investments is that, you know, I'm focused on Texas Triangle. I live in Houston. So that's Dallas, Houston, and San Antonio. And just the belief that there is a huge migration of people coming to the Texas Triangle because it's a great place to live, work, and play. Um, and, you know, I'm an example of that because I came from New York, a transplant, um, and moved here about 10 years ago. And we had many opportunities to move back to the East Coast. But, you know, to this day, we've, we've chosen each and every time to stay here in Houston. So, you know, that's one, just the 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 affordability, the you know, the niceties of living in Texas and, and the, the good business environment. And then on the multifamily side, just, you know, I think as we look at our country, you know, for better, or for worse, or sadly, however you want to think about it is, you know, this coronavirus piece is probably even exacerbated it, but there is, you know, this cultural divide of people have done really well during this period and people that, you know, unfortunately maybe renters for life, but, you know, we can offer them something that is clean, safe, and, and, um, a place to call home. And so, you know, that's something that resonated with me. And I believe that, you know, we are, you know, becoming this nation of renters where unfortunately we kind of outspend our means and, you know, but still these people have a right to, to live in a, in a clean place. Um, and I think rentership has uh, a lot of benefits versus homeownership. I myself, um, lived in both and uh you know living in a home sometimes is not all it's cracked up to be when you have to fix water leaks and you know other things like that yourself versus have a, a team of maintenance professionals that, that can do that for you yeah that's really interesting because i'm wrestling with that decision myself well i didn't mean to say wrestling but it just, yeah no that's awesome yeah, <laughs> like ding ding <laughs> but i'm wrestling with that decision myself because it's one thing you know they always say your house is not a not an asset right it's more of a liability because you pay everything right. and it's also just like you said when stuff breaks in your house it seems to be 10 times worse than if it, you have a, a rental because you know, you have rental co income coming in on that rental, but something Absolutely. breaks in your house. It's just, yeah. you're paying that mortgage and then you're paying whatever, you know, a roof, re a roof leak, a, Absolutely. Absolutely. a water heater, whatever. It's so much more painful. So I always wrestle with that decision myself of whether to rent or to, 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 <laughs> to buy. But, you know, it's, it's great that you talk about how important it is to provide and it's something that you really value is to provide a, a tenants with a great place to live. You know, and something I talk about all the time is that, you know, I think landlords get misunderstood a lot of times because we do take pleasure from providing a great place. It's, you know, it's good to see that you have a property that's, you know, that has a community, that has people living there, that enjoy living there, you know, that might not have such a, a good option in that area if, if it wasn't for your property, you know. And I think, I think us as landlords, and especially right now, we don't necessarily get the best reputation, right? But I think when you talk about that and people see how important that is, I think, I think that's great to hear for people to understand that. Um, so th thanks for, for for talking about that. So then you go, you, you decide to, 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 to go to venture into your own deal. You know, there's, you have now all kinds of options, right? You can do your own deal, you can be a passive, but you, you kind of, to some extent, I would guess, would you say do both? It was a mixture between active and, and passive because you were a co-sponsor, but at that time you didn't have any experience, right? You were just relying on this other person's experience. Sure. 
Sure. Yeah. So in, in, in the first, I guess, deal that I did in multifamily was a passive deal. And, you know, I've done 13 of them and, uh, you know, two I've co-sponsored. We're closing one next month and we are just signed a PSA today, actually. So, um, you know, we've the experience to, you know, be a passive investor. You learn a lot from that as well. You learn how how does the, the management team you know, what do they do? How do they treat investors? And you just get insight on what properties are performing, which ones aren't, and try to find some causal, causal themes as to why or why not. Um, so, yeah, I mean, on the sponsorship side, it was something that, you know, for me, I just felt like, you know, there's a lot of uh, firepower or just a lot of capacity to do uh, in the multifamily space. And so said, you know, just being passive, you know, particularly as this was a career choice for me, it was, you know, I wanted to be active and I wanted to get my hands really dirty and I wanted to kind of apply a level of analysis in, in the space that, uh, you know, I thought would, 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 would do well versus, um, you know, kind of the, yeah, just, just how I've been successful in wall street and applying that to, to this space. For those people who don't know, when you say co-sponsor, what do you mean by that as well? Yeah, sure. So, you know, there was two gentlemen that found the transaction and then, you know, they brought me in, um, you know, to, to help out with the asset management and to, to raise some capital and so forth. So that's, that's what it is. I mean, in, in terms of uh, multifamily, so you have your general partners. So myself and two, two other gentlemen, the general partners on these transactions, and then you have your limited partners, your passive investors. So, you know, you need, you need every, you know, those, those two groups of people to make the deal work, but typically your GP is going to be more day to day. And, you know, I guess day to day for the people on the GP side that want to do the asset management um, and go through and dig through the financials and so forth and interact with the property management team and, and the staff on site. Uh, and that's what I wanted to do uh, to really understand the business. I guess I just, you know, in my career was like, let me learn every aspect of the value chain and then be able to, you know, speak to that, um, in a holistic manner and be able to solve problems and, you know, to get that respect that this person has, you know, understands what we're going through um, and isn't just, you know, calling down from the ivory tower, this, this, do this, do this, do that. So um, a little bit of, you know, just getting my hands dirty and really truly understanding the business. Yeah. Yeah. So you, but you mentioned you were passive to start off with, uh, you went passive. Mm -hmm. How many deals, passive deals did you do before you got active? Eh? Uh, I think it was just, it was like two. Okay. One or two, yeah, yeah, yeah. I think. How, and how did you find the um, the the syndicators on that one, the general partners? That, that's one of yeah, the so a, a friend a friend of mine had introduced me to them, and so um, you know, and I just I asked them a ton of questions, and you know, sometimes it's it's the question behind the question, and and how they respond to it, and you know, do they go above and beyond to explain it to you? And I get frankly, very comfortable. And, you know, the first deal is, you know, and it, and it was, uh, you know, a few reasons why I invested in it, but, uh, you know, it's been one of the best performing deals. So that was, I don't know if it was luck or what, but, <laughs> or asking the right questions, but, um, you know, I think that it's been helpful. It's been helpful to, you know, understand a market. I mean, we're looking at a transaction and, you know, I've invested in two of the comps I've toured, the other three. So there's, you know, I know those really well, so I can, you know, say what are the, the highs and lows of those properties and how do they compare versus the one I'm buying. So, you know, those types of things to really truly understand the market and, you know, get a, get a good insight into what's happening. So you can make the best in decisions for your investors. Yeah. Yeah. So then you, you said you invested in 13 passive deals now, so you continue to invest passively while being active. Was there a reason that you kept doing that? Just um, yeah, I mean, last year is all about tax purposes. So, um, you know, one deal I was hoping that it would close last year and it didn't and it, you know, put me into 2020. So that was the only one that I've passively invested in this year. So most of, most of my investments will be in the deals that I sponsor. Um, and then to a lesser extent, some, some passive opportunities as those passive deals roll um, and come to fruition. Okay. So then you did your own, so, you, so then you said you, you found um, two gentlemen that found the deal and you, 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 know, you ended up being a general partner with them. Um, mm -hmm. Tell us a little bit about that deal, the first deal. Uh, yeah. What was the size? Maybe it was a purchase price? What, what was yeah, the, sure. 
Yeah. Sure, sure. So that deal is 154 units in uh, the Dallas Fort Worth metro. So amazing, amazing market. Uh, you know, it's a 1980s vintage, which we paid just around 90 a door for, and which is, you know, that was last May. And so, you know, we put uh, agency financing on a stabilized property and it's been, it's been a great asset. I um, mean, you know, I think that's one of those deals where um, it's going to be worth incredible amount when we sell it just because a very similar, similar vintage, similar size asset traded for um, 120 a door, just two, three miles from there. So, um, you know, that that's and cap rates are, are going down. DFW has been, you know, still continues to be red hot. So, um, you know, that I'm looking forward to when we can we can sell that because I think it'll it'll return nicely for us. And, you know, we're going through some value add programs, but uh, you know that's been performing well. Um, so we're excited about that one. And then and um, kind of coterminous with that. Uh, there's a 238 unit property in Athens, Georgia, that's about three or four miles from the University of Athens, which is a growing university, um, great town. And, um, you know, the, those kind of tertiary markets come in with a higher cap rate. So you have a little bit more cushion. We got great financing on it. It was 3.88, but that was last, last July. So, um, you know, people are in the low threes now, but we got that last year. And, and so that property is actually we're going to be about 95 percent occupied this month and so that's been humming along our revenue numbers have been the highest since we've owned it um and you know just given cap rates and so forth uh you know that should also be you know a great opportunity to uh to divest one day um so you know i think it's kind of fortunately it came in at the right time um, you know, before cap rates started compressing, but you know, that has agency financing on it. It's a uh, 30 some odd acres. So it's this really unique product, which I, I kind of the things that I like is seeing unique product where it's, it just, you know, if I feel good going there, I, I kind of have this kid test where if I can bring my daughter there and, and my son and they're like, yeah, this is great. Um, you know, cause that's how a prospective tenant's going to feel right. And at the end of the day, you're selling a product. And if that product isn't attractive to the people owning it or buying it, you know, it's going to be hard. It's going to be an uphill battle. And so, you know, it's, uh, there's like this stream that runs through it. It's this very tranquil uh, place. And so, you know, unique product um, in a sub market there, they don't add much supply. So it just, it has those positive things going. And so, you know, that, uh, that one is, you know, we're just, just almost getting close to being inside 10% economic vacancy as well. So we've gone through a period where we were rehabbing units and then bringing that, um, stabilizing the property again and so forth. So, you know, despite COVID and all that, we're finally, um, seem to be in a, in a good spot, which is, which is exciting. Yeah. 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 COVID has messed things up a little bit for everyone, right? Just, um, <laughs> Such an interesting scenario. But um, can you tell us a little bit about, you know, I, I'd, lo I'd love to hear what your investment criteria is when you guys are looking at properties. I'm sure you guys have yeah. a, quite a strict criteria. And I think that would yeah. Be yeah, for sure. I mean, I even, I, you know, could put a presentation. I could share my screen if you want to see that or, or you know, it's up to you or I could just talk you through it. Um, yeah, because I don't know. I'd have to make you the host or something, right? And I'm not that... Techie. Yeah. So <laughs> yeah. you tell me if, you know, yeah, I don't know if talk, maybe just talk. What, yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. sure. So, um, you know, I would say we have different high level criteria and, you know, one of those is we like to see median income north of 35, you know, the higher, the better type of thing, mm -hmm. um, you know, home values that are going to be, you know, two X what, um, the value of the property is. We just want that moat around the asset that, um, you know, there are some properties where we're like, oh, these townhomes are, you know, we're buying them at, you know, 120 a door, but home values are 100. It's like, well, that doesn't make sense. I'd rather buy like the whole street and rent those out versus buy townhomes. So, um, so that's one. And then, you know, going in cap rate, I mean, the higher, the better as well. But we always expense normalize and property tax adjust our, 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 our cap rates to just make sure how does this going to look when we own it with our expenses, um, you know, just to make sure we're not overpaying, i.e. where people can, can get caught up as if someone were self-managing and they say like, oh, our payroll zero. Well, that's not how we're going to run it. We're going to have to put somebody in there. And, um, you know, so you want to understand how does the cap rate look when you, when you burden it with the proper expenses. 
so then the Texas Triangle is is where we focus. And so again, Dallas, Houston, San Antonio, uh, you know, 1960s to 1980s. And then, you know, in terms of unit count, you know, um, 80 units and above is what we look for. Uh, and then, you know, the thing that we also really like is, is we like good financing. And that tells us a good story about the asset is if you can get good financing, that means the lenders, you know, frankly, they're taking more risk in a way than, than you are. And so if they're willing to do that, that's kind of, you know, a good, a good problem to have. So um, we'd like to see that. Um, yeah, that's, that's kind of the, the criteria at a high level. Yeah. We'd like to see good performance. I guess, you know, another thing is if the asset's been performing well, um, you know, there's a premium on the price. Okay. We, we, we think there's a price for everything, but if, the, if you're going to ask for a premium price, I want to see, you know, really good performance. Um, I don't want to see, you know, economic vacancy, 30% and bad debt, five, six, 7%. And, you know, um, because I think that should then be baked into the purchase price that, hey, this thing comes with a lot of hair on it, it needs to be stabilized. And, and, um, and if something isn't stabilized, like I don't want it to effectively be sold on a pro forma um, either. So if there is 25, 30% economic vacancy, I don't want to be paying, you know, year one, 10% economic vacancy. And, and, you know, that to me, that just seems a little bit odd. Like it's going to take some time to stabilize it. So we need to, you know, make sure that the price reflects that. So at a high level, those are the things that we look for, have a lot of data then that we dig into and, you know, spend a lot of time building different models to get to quicker answers and better answers quicker. So, um, yeah, you guys, do you guys like value add or do you like, more of yield play properties or is it, is it no we would like both uh you, you know i think that there's there's value in both if it's a yield play then you know i think the price should reflect it it should have a higher cap rate and if it's a value add you know it just depends if it's something like you know we're not we're probably like ten thousand and under type rehab people um, a door and if it's it's above that that's probably not something that we're that interested in unless it's got an amazing story to it you guys prefer the uh, cosmetic stuff, right? The interior kind of. Yeah, yeah. I think you know, just just lighter, lighter rehab, uh, because I think that tends to play itself better for someone that has some more vertical integration on the construction side. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. If you start doing some deeper rehabs. Yeah. Now, how how have these properties been doing during the the pandemic? Yeah. So, you know, it, uh, it was concerning at first, you know, we're like, well, oh, how's, how's this going to happen? How, what's going to happen? And, and despite everything that's going on, you know, both of them from an occupancy perspective, from revenue, both are hitting some of the highest revenue levels that they, the properties hit, um, from an NOI perspective as well. So, you know, I've been, you know, quite pleased from a cash perspective as well. So that, that has helped me truly understand the values and merits of multifamily. Um, and I think from a, a COVID, if this were going to happen, it happened for us at a very good point because we were in our interest only period. So we just had more cushion because you're just paying interest. Your debt service isn't as burdensome um, versus, you know, that that happens when you're just moving from interest only to, to full amortization. And that can be, you know, tougher to meet that service. But yeah, I mean, both of them, I think were north of 1.6 or so DSCR, even one, I think was at two. So um you know, a lot of cushion in both deals. So, you know, we've been excited about that, been distributing cash monthly on both both properties. And that's something that's important to us and just giving good visibility and transparency to investors. Yeah, yeah, that's, that's great. That's great. Congratulations, because yeah, I think multifamily has held up really well. You know, people have been surprised, I think, across the board, right? When it first hit, I think everyone's reactions were similar to you. Oh, Absolutely. oh no, what's going to happen next, Absolutely. right? And then Absolutely. month by month, it keeps keeps the collections still remain high. I think we're at ninety four percent nationally. Uh, uh, collections that you know they dropped a little bit in the last month. I think from ninety seven, but still, considering everything that's going around with you know everything's falling all around us, that multifamily is still still such a strong asset class because it's the old adage: everyone needs somewhere to live, right? And you know, Absolutely. you're going to prioritize where you live over everything else. So. I think that's great that you guys, you guys were able to do that. Um, now, the question is, where do we go sure. from here, right? And you mentioned there that you're still buying. Has anything changed in your, um, 
as you underwrite deals and as you look at deals and the type of asset that you're buying, has any of that changed? Are you still bullish? Yeah, you know, so I think, you know, for this deal that we're acquiring, we're forecasting 0% income growth in the first year, zero. So like everything we're going to do at the property and just saying income is going to be zero. Um, and I think, you know, yeah, we have, we have said we need to scale back, you know, some of the income growth projections because, you know, I think there's, there's still a lot of uncertainty and risk uh, out there, but one thing I can con confidently say is that if you buy the right asset in the right location with the right financing, you'll be fine. Mm -hmm. And, you know, for us, that's why we're so picky. We've looked at, 200 plus deals this year and, you know, have effectively bid on, you know, bid on about 10% of those and, you know, have won two of them. So, um, that's, that's kind of the numbers that, 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 that we play, uh, in, in the multifamily space is that not everything is a good deal and you have to buy right. Um, that's, that's just super, super important. For instance, we're, you know, buying deals at, you know, 20, 30% less than, than, uh, some of the sales comps out there. So that, we just want that cushion. It's kind of, for me coming from Wall Street, everything is a trade. So, you know, what's my basis versus what, you know, is out there and, and just trying to, again, build that moat so that if something goes wrong, hey, we have some cushion. I think, uh, you know, everyone would love to buy everything at 20, 30% <laughs> below what the competition is paying, right? Sure. How are you guys managing to do that, you know, because obviously... You know, yeah, I'm, I'm, what, you make your money when you buy, right? That's absolutely, absolutely. So, you know, a lot of it is perseverance. I mean, we look at so many deals and, you know, this one deal that, uh, you know, were one was an off market deal and then two is an opportunity where, um, you know, we bid on it in December and it fell out of contract. So, you know, we were able to pick it up. Um, you know, they had gone through a little dip in, because of COVID and it fell out of contract at the lows, the very, very lows. And then then it swung up. I mean, the performance, uh, I think it was like 13% growth from like the lows to, to now. And so what we were paying a six cap for turned out to be a seven cap deal. So it's like, wow. you know, it improved that much. So, you know, that's that's pretty exciting. So, you know, sometimes it's just, you gotta, you gotta, you gotta, gotta get back up when you get body slammed. Right. So yeah, yeah. you gotta kiss enough frogs, right. To find that. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> absolutely. You know, yeah, absolutely. You be out there pounding the pavement. And, um, it's something people say that, you know, you get lucky finding deals, but I, I disagree, right. You get lucky because you, you know, like you said, you guys looked at, um, 200 deals, 200 deals this year, right? And, Absolutely, yeah. You know, we're only in September. That's a lot of deals. It's a lot of deals. It's a lot of deals. To, to kind of, to figure out, you know, if this is a good deal, if this do I want to offer? And you said you, you offered them, what, about 10% of that, you know, and that's still, you know, 20 properties that you made offers yes. to, to find those deals. So um, I'm glad you guys found some deals. That's, you know, congratulations on that. It's, Thank you. You know, you, even in the worst of times, right, you can still find deals, right? Even when you think everything's going wrong, there's always deals. You should always be trying to buy, you know, they, you know, there's, there's all, when's a good time to buy now, right? As long as you get the right deal. So I think that's really cool. Um, I was wondering, you, you talked about the investors a little bit there. How are you guys finding investors for your deals? Uh, you know, a few different channels. Um, one is people that, that have known me professionally. Uh, that's been a, a big part of my investor database. And, and two is people that have invested in my deals previously that knew me and now telling their boss and their friends. And, and that's kind of what we want. We want to be known by reputation and, you know, that reference, cause that's so strong. Um, and then, you know, I have, uh, I guess, podcasts like this, people will reach out. Um, and then, yeah, I mean, just trying to add value, add content, and, and then, you know, trying to, like, I've, I've created a, a few different documents, but one is 25 questions every passive investor should ask. And that is, I think it's six, seven pages or so of, you know, what people should look for or, or just, you know, suggestions to ask when they're, before they're investing in a multifamily deal. And then uh, also put together a, a toolkit called the multifamily toolkit, which is you know, top 50 curated resources and links and sites to bookmark. So just a way, you know, been a big fan of, you know, adding value and then just saying the investors will come, you know, because they'll say, wow, I really appreciate how much thought you put into this. It's above and beyond what other people have done. And so that 
you know, portends well to when you find a deal, the mad, the a number, the amount of analytics and time you're going to spend on it. So, um, kind of that combination has been important to us. And and again, just barring for my professional career is compete in a very, very competitive, uber competitive space. And, uh, you know, multifamily is, is similarly competitive, um, but you had to find a way to differentiate. And, you know, for me, it's, it's, it's always been through adding value and that customer service aspect. Yeah, yeah, great. Without giving too much of it away, maybe do you want to touch on a few things that um, passive investors should look out for without giving away yeah, the whole well, document? Yeah, no, for sure. Well, I'm, I'm happy to share that with any of the listeners to your podcast. Uh, cool. So as long as you give me a, a signed uh, Barry Griffiths uh, from my dad. So, uh, so uh, you know, the, the first question is, and kind of starts off with, you know, 80% of the deal is, do you, do you trust the sponsors? Because if you don't trust them, um, don't even spend time on the deal. Like if you get a bad vibe, just, you know, don't walk, run. And uh, so that's, that's kind of number one. And then, you know, number two is, you know, just, just digging through and, you know, is this a sub market that you're interested in? Does it have a good growth story or the incomes, you know, something where the people can afford the rents? Um, you know, because a lot of these deals you see, and they're forecasting some crazy rent growth and, just understanding the the sensitivities in a model, it's really two things um, is rent growth, even like a two to two and a half to 3%, like dramatically changes returns. And then the reversion cap rate, you know, every 25 basis points, lower or higher adds, you know, 10, 15, 20% to return. So it's, it's very, very meaningful. And, um, you know, so just looking and understanding and understanding that is that is that commensurate with the market? Is this person buying, you know, at a six cap in a, you know, higher than that cap market? Or are they paying, you know, uh, a four cap when the market's five? Like it's, you know, is this a good deal or is this, you know, not a good deal? And um, so th those are the things that, uh, you know, is are things disclosed really well? And you know, because it, another thing is, and it goes back to the sponsorship. A lot of this goes back to the sponsorship team. Did they, did they exercise good business judgment in terms of, you know, the way that they've conducted themselves and their interactions with the people they brought on the team and so forth. And if not, then it's kind of just a red flag. Yeah. Yeah. yeah that's, that's great. Cause you always bet on the, uh, bet on the jockey, not the horse, right? But absolutely. absolutely. <laughs> you know, it's, um, it's important that you get to know the people that you're going to be giving your hard and money to for and they understand that yeah. what their track record is, you know, Absolutely. what they're investing in, what they what, what they look to achieve, you know, and, and I think people need to understand those things before they invest with people. Um, I think, I think, you know, people hear about the passive investing and they think, Oh, should I buy a single family home and buy, run it myself? Or should I invest in a, maybe perhaps a syndication through this interview? Hopefully they, 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 realize that, you know, what's available with syndication from your experience, who, you know, what type of person does a syndication and a passive investor kind of suit to, to be, you know, because it's, I think there's a certain type of person, right? I don't mean like it's an accountant or it's a 20 sure. male or something, but it, their lifestyle, yeah. what they're looking to achieve from their investments. Perhaps. Yeah, sure. So I think, you know, multifamily one is they, they have to understand, I mean, these are illiquid investments and we tell investors, you know, think about it as five years. I mean, that's, we underwrite for a five year hold. So for five years and maybe longer, because we're putting 10 year debt on, on our properties is, you know, this, because if we have another COVID period or another, you know, dis distress market period, you know, we may not, we may need to hold it longer than, than, you know, we'd like. Um, so they need to have that liquidity cushion that, you know, this isn't money for food on the table right now. Um, so I think that's, that's number one is just understanding this is not like buying Amazon stock where you can get in and out of it a hundred times a day. Like this is, you know, there's no liquidity in this market in terms of once you're a passive or very little liquidity, I should say. Uh, so that's one. And then two is, um, you know, someone, I, I think multifamily particularly is from a cash flow perspective um, is great. You know, if they, if particularly if they are a real estate professional or their wife is or spouse and, you know, the, the tax advantages are, are really unparalleled. Uh, and then, and then, lastly, from a passive cash flow, I, I will say that 
Um, it's been nice. It's been nice, you know, 13 deals and, and getting, you know, monthly checks um, feels good. Uh, it's, 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 it's nice to see that cash flow and, you know, to also say I invest in the right time because cap rates have just come down. So, you know, the timing was good and, you know, cap rate compression really, you know, maybe, yeah, they're not hitting pro formers now, or maybe the rent growth hasn't been what they projected, but, you know, some of these deals will make up on the exit. Yeah. I, I, <laughs> I've invested passively in a deal as well. I, I enjoy getting that. Well, they've, they've gone to quarterly now, but it was monthly distributions. Okay. Yeah. Okay. It was, um, you know, it's pretty nice without, you know, you do your work up front, right? You do your work initially when you do your due diligence on the team and on the deal. But after that, it's really is mailbox money, right? You just Absolutely. read their monthly newsletter or whatever it is that their quarterly reports. Sure. That's it. Enjoy the cash flow. You know, it's really, Absolutely. And Absolutely. You, you know, of course, you're involved in this large deal that you could never normally buy, right? If you're buying a $20 million asset, there's no way most people can buy that for themselves. They're involved in that. They enjoy the experience of the team and the success that the team has had previously. They piggyback on that, you know, and, you know, you get to enjoy all of this. Whereas if you invest in a single family property yourself and you have no experience, it's all on you. And again, you, you know, the most beautiful thing about multifamily is that if you have a hundred unit property and one person goes out, well, you're still 99% occupied. Absolutely. If you're a single family home and one, one tenant leaves, well, absolutely. you're hundred percent. Absolutely. Absolutely. There's, you know, that those nice benefits is, is, you know, there's people that just do passive deals and the nice thing is, you know, can be a pretty nice lifestyle if, if you have the, you know, you need a fair amount of capital base to be able to do that, but it's, uh, that's one nice thing. Yeah. Yeah. Very cool. Um, if you don't mind me asking, how do you structure the returns with the, your investors? Are all the yeah, or... typically we're straight splits. So it's 80-20. Uh, it's so 80% to the LP, 20% to the GP. I invest in all my deals, um, tend to be one of the largest equity um, LPs as well. And just because, you know, we wouldn't be pitching you the deal if we didn't believe in it, just, you know, from an ethical standpoint. Uh, and then typically a 2% asset management fee and then typically a one or so percent acquisition fee. So pretty straight, you know, when we completely disclose all that. So people know what they're getting into and then the returns and we, you know, every return, every number that we express is, is net to the investor. So after all those fees, we bake those into the model. And so what the guidance we provide is um, to, to LPs is, you know, typically we're looking at, you know, 70 to 80 plus percent. And we try to be very realistic about the return. So our underwriting is extremely conservative um, and we don't want to overpromise and underdeliver. Um, and then, you know, from a cash on cash perspective, you know, just depending on the deal, if it's more of a yield play, it should be higher and it's more a stabilized asset, I, it should be higher, but, you know, typically we're looking for 8% plus. And then from an IRR perspective, you know, anywhere from 12 to 15 plus percent. Nice. Nice. You guys did a higher equity split rather than give, you guys don't give a preferred return, right? No, typically not. I think, you know, there's, there's pros and cons, you know, just like there's, there's no perfect way to structure a uh, compensation, but you know, at the end of the day, you want your sponsorship team to be incentivized all the time. You know, if, Hey, if I can give another dollar in the door or another dollar of NOI or cash flow, I want my sponsorship team to be focused on that no matter how, what performance is, but all the time. And the preferred, you know, one of the things that can be a detractor is that, you know, if people had really aggressive assumptions and the market turns and they're never going to, you know, hit their promotes, they may, you know, if, again, if the sponsor is not ethical, they may say like, Hey, I'm onto greener pastures. I'm gonna look for the next deal, click the next acquisition fee. Um, and, you know, not worry about the deal that's never going to pay me anything. So we like to be incentivized all the time to do the right thing. Yeah. It's kind of just how we feel good about it. It's straight, it's clear to investors and easy to explain. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And I think the clearer and the easier it's explained to people, I think the better, right? Just makes sense. So cool. Well, that's a, that's a, a lot of great information. Um, I don't know if now you want to tag team your dad. Now might be a good time if you wanted to tag team your dad. In. Yeah, yeah, let's do it. Let's do, let's get a little <laughs> screenshot or something. Yeah, yeah, this is awesome. I'll, uh, if you give me a, my address, if you give me your address afterwards, I'll, I'll send something to your dad. Oh, that'd be awesome. He'd love that. He'd love that. Yeah, that'd be fantastic. Yeah, I'll, I'll definitely do that. Uh, he's a big fan. I mean, he's still video recording him and, and all that. So. 
that's awesome. I love it. I love it. Um, so as as I mentioned before the show, as before we started recording, the show's called Wrestling with Real Estate. So I like to ask yes. some wrestling themed That's questions. fantastic. I love it. It's great. <laughs> so the first question is, um, what would your wrestling name be? If you had to choose a wrestling name for yourself, what would it be? You know, I'd probably take Jimmy Fly Super Snooker because <laughs> uh, you know, that is that is the guy that uh, you know, I broke many a fence post trying to, you know, we used to have these cedar fences, right, where where I grew up. And we climb on these things, jump off the top, and this, you know, cedar gets frail. And so I, I've, I've, you know, cratered many of those fences, jamming, climbing up to the top and doing a Jimmy, Jimmy Superfly snook off the top rope. So. <laughs> he, was, he was phenomenal. He was, he was yeah. such a great guy. I wrestled with his daughter for a while. To me, oh, nice. He was nice. I met, met him. I met him a few times. He was such a character. He always wore, like, um, um, animal print, um, yeah, yeah. Has animal print. He, like even when he was in his, I don't know, seventies or eighties, he would oh, turn wow, wow. and watch his daughter with, you know, a, a jacket made of animal print. It was just That's awesome. You could tell he was just full of charisma. You know, such an amazing character. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So then a- every wrestler has a special move. Like Jimmy Snooker used to come off the top rope, right? Every yeah. wrestler has a special move. What would your special move in real estate be? You know, I think we are all about process and you know just making sure no stone is unturned you know when we say we're going to do something we do it Uh, you know when a broker sends us something we follow up um, as we say we're going to do so those things are just really important to us just shows a level of professionalism Um, so I would say that's just been an important important thing for me is that um, you know putting this in our process and outcomes, you know, over time, success. Very cool, very cool. Uh, what's been your biggest body slam you've taken in your real estate investing career? Yeah, you know, one one tough thing is, uh, you know, in March we had a, an LOI accepted for a deal, and then it uh, COVID happened and oil prices happened, they went negative. Um, so all of that and the disruption in the markets and so forth. So unfortunately, it became a feeding frenzy for that deal, and and we lost it. Um, and that, w- that was really tough. And that was going to be, you know, the transaction we were going to lead. And it was just a marquee transaction and awesome. Just had everything that we wanted in the deal. Um, so, you know, having to get over that. And then, you know, fortunately, we have, you know, two other deals now that that uh, we've rebounded for. So, so that's really good. So you have to get up, you know, you're going to take a lot of hits um, and you got to get off the mat. Yeah, for sure, for sure. Was there a moment you were standing on the top rope, getting ready to jump? Were you too scared? What was it and how did you overcome it? Maybe not seeing as you've been climbing cedar posts all your life, maybe. <laughs> you yeah, there. yeah, yeah, I know. Uh, <laughs> you know, um, I think, you know, even this deal that we bid on in December, um, you know, we, we, you know, it's, we're, we're going to close it next month. But, you know, we, we were... A little bit cautious on on the pricing. We just spent a lot of time, and I think you know early on we'd spend so much time, and that was you know we we're getting into a, a new market, um, and so we just like spend tons and tons and tons of time. And then you know, there's an element of you have to trust. Like you know we're looking at um, different deals, and we're saying like wow, you know like how we're valuing it, and this is how the other person's valuing it, or you know how a, a professional's valuing or the property management. So. Um, you know, we, we just built a lot of confidence, I would say, um, over the past, you know, year and, you know, kind of submitting an LOI is not, you know, as big of a deal as it was. And, you know, as, as cautious of a time as it was, and, you know, just having that confidence that, you know, tr- trust your numbers. Like you, you guys have spent a lot of time and done a lot of homework and, you know, you're able to cuff things a lot quicker because you know the market. So I think that that trepidation, you know, when we were standing and, you know, uh, you know, now it's, it's, there's, there's, there's a, a confidence, but not overly confident, but confident, yeah. rightly confident. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Great. Well, Ryan, thank you so much uh, for, for sharing that. Thanks for being fun and playing part in the wrestling with real estate, jumping yeah, in the, absolutely. The, the real estate ring, as, as it per se. But um, That's awesome. before we go, how can people get a hold of you? Maybe people want to find out more about these future investments that you have. Maybe people are interested in being a passive investor in your deal. Or sure. Maybe getting that article you talked about. 
Absolutely. Yeah, yeah for sure. Um, check out lifechangingcapital.com, uh, my website, and we have some resources there. You can contact me through there, set up a time to chat. Uh, that's probably the best way. And, um, you know, the 25 questions every passive investor should ask or the multifamily toolkit. And you can, you can find that through there. So, um, you know, really appreciate Barry, you having me on. It's been great. Uh, this has been, I almost, I was telling you earlier, I should be interviewing you and not the other <laughs> way around. So thanks so much for your time and, and for, for inviting me on. Of course. It was absolutely my pleasure. That was a fun interview. And, um, you know, I can tell you super intelligent, super driven, super, super successful and and just on top of that you're a great guy i can tell that so you deserve all the success in the world so i'm glad to hear that thank and, you so much um, yeah hopefully we can keep in touch and i'd love to hear more about those two deals Absolutely. how they develop how how you turn in yeah sure the sure the killer deals and yeah 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 so cool thank you so much man have a great day and it was fantastic speaking with you thank you barry